I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Exodus 33:20. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. My spirit went up, and I literally went to the throne room of God. I won't say much, but I'll say something that's important for me to teach you here today. So in that divine encounter, I don't know how long I was there. I just know that kind of power is almost impossible for a natural body to contain. And as I went to the throne room of God, first I saw there was a mist that was coming off the water and I went to the throne of God and I didn't see God's face clearly, but I saw the face of God. It wasn't a clear, not like I could see your face clearly, but I knew it was the face of God. And as God began, he put a mantle on me and it was a very distinct mantle. I had no idea that Apostle had prophesied. I think you said that there was a mantle that was coming upon me, that there was a new mantle coming upon me. And there was a mantle, and I saw it very distinctly. The color was like a, a goldish, but it, did, it was a yellowish goldish, a little bit different than your scarf, a little bit brighter than your scarf there. And then I saw the earth for a moment and then he brought me back and he put me in certain places, one being the White House, one being certain continents. It was a mass move. I didn't come out of that really until the next morning. Matthew 24, 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophet is the Greek word pseudo-prophetes, which means a pretended foreteller or religious imposter. A false prophet is a person who spreads false teachings or messages while claiming to speak the word of God. Rather than speak the word of the Lord, false prophets deliver messages that originate in their own hearts as we read in Jeremiah 23, 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. In the Old Testament, punishment for false prophets was severe as we read in Deuteronomy 18.20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. In the New Testament, Jesus warns his followers about false prophets as we read in Matthew 7.15-20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Jesus then gives a dire warning to false prophets 
as we read in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Scripture teaches believers to be diligent in faith and devotion to Christ's teachings so that they will be able to spot false prophets and false teachers quickly. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. 1 John 4.1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. What does it mean to test the spirits? The reason for the admonition to test the spirits, or test all things, is that there are many false prophets, or wolves in sheep's clothing, that try to lead Christians astray. Sadly, there are many people who claim to speak for God, who are presenting a false gospel that is powerless to save. Such errant teaching leaves people with a false hope of salvation. 2 Corinthians 11:13 through 15 warns us, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The reason for testing the spirits is to see if it is truly from God, or if it is a lie from Satan and his servants. The test is to compare what is being taught with the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible alone is the Word of God. It alone is inspired and inerrant. Therefore, the way to test the spirits is to see if what is being taught is in line with the clear teaching of Scripture. In Acts 17, 10, and 11, the Berean Jews were commended because after they heard the teachings of Paul and Silas, they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were called noble for doing so. Testing the spirits means that one must know how to examine the scriptures. Rather than accept every teaching, discerning Christians diligently study the scriptures. Then they know what the Bible says and therefore can test all things and hold fast to what is true. In order to do this, a Christian must be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God is to be a lamp and a light to our path. We must let its light shine on the teachings and doctrines of the day. The Bible alone is the standard by which all truth must be judged. 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. As we can plainly see, Paula White is a false prophet, as what she said clearly goes against what is proclaimed in the Bible, Exodus 33.20. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. The matter of faith. There have been men, many of them, who claim to be a new Messiah. And tonight, we're going to meet three of them, including one in the faraway Philippines who has amassed a flock, he says, numbers in the millions. Poor people who give what little they have to the man they believe is the second coming of Jesus. Bill Weir journeyed there to meet him. Throughout the Bible, prophets, angels, and Jesus himself all promised that the Son of God would return to create heaven on earth. And throughout the ages, billions of Christians have wondered, when? But what if the second coming is here, now? There are a number of would-be messiahs who claim exactly that, and few are more physically convincing than a former Russian traffic cop named Sergei Torop. In the woods of rural Siberia, he is known as Vissarion, the teacher. And around 5,000 disciples live around him, growing their own food and feasting on his every word. And my whole body was trembling. The trembling is not coming again. <laughs> well, it's a, a very emotional to me. Meanwhile, in London, David Shaler says he is the true Lord of Lords. But unlike Vissarion, no one believes him. That doesn't bother me because I was chosen by God. 
The former British intelligence agent says his body was filled with the spirit of Jesus in 2007, a conviction which intensifies on a visit to Jerusalem. We're in the Church Holy Sepulchre, and this behind me is supposed to be the tomb of Christ. Well, I'm Christ, I'm not in the tomb, I'm not dead yet. But with no support, he lives in a squatter's camp outside London. By agreement with Jesus, I don't ask for money off people. If you're the Messiah, you shouldn't be asking for money, you should have faith that God will look after you. Prove to me that you are a son of God! But that is not a sentiment shared by Pastor Apollo Quibbeloy, the most successful of the world's self-labeled saviors. The official coming of the Son of God was in April 13, 2005. He was an obscure evangelist from the rural Philippines until 2005 when he announced that God had appointed him Christ on earth. He is an ordinary Australian making an extraordinary claim. AJ Miller says he's Jesus Christ. We first found him spruiking his message in Australia, but now this self-proclaimed son of God has taken his mission to the world. Denham Hitchcock caught up with AJ deep in the heart of Texas. I'm going to have to say that I'm Jesus. That's how much rage is there, you see? I certainly don't want to be Jesus. <laughs> At the moment, I certainly don't want to be Jesus. His name is Alan John Miller, or AJ, a former IT worker from Queensland's Bible Belt with one hell of a story. He claims he's Jesus Christ, back from the dead, to spread a message he calls the divine truth. And remember that it has been prophesied in the Bible and other places that I was going to do this, that I was going to return. You see, Oprah, there is still so much more that God needs me to express to the world. It's not just a coincidence that I look like Jesus. I am the modern day Jesus Christ that you all have been waiting for. The man who claims he is Jesus Christ. Only his name is Moses. Moses Tlongwane. But he says, like his namesake, he has spent years in the wilderness and has been resurrected as the Son of God. Ladies and gentlemen of the Western white races, I am the Lord Jesus Christ. My name today is Brian Leonard Gulati Marshall. The news of my return has been kept secret from you by Pope Francis, who is a Jew, a Jesuit, and he is a black pope. Below this video are links where you can do the research for yourself. My message to Europe and the Christian world is quite simple. You are my people. You are the lost sheep. I told the apostles that I was going to. I ask Jesus shed my blood to release the Father, God Almighty, that is the Holy Ghost, this is the soul of Jesus, that is myself, on April the 3rd, 33 AD. I'll make it quite simple. If you do not join my holy war, you will join the Muslims and the Jews, and I will cast you, along with them, back into hell. Now, I want you to form a delegation from all nations and go to Francis, demand to see Pope Benedict, and confirm what I am telling you is true. He won't deny it. But Francis will do his best to stop you singing. Pope Benedict. My face is on the Shroud of Turin. This is what amazed Pope Benedict. So, do it. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The second coming of Jesus Christ will be a worldwide event. There will be absolutely no doubt in anyone's mind as to whether this is Jesus. The record number of flu deaths in children blamed on an unusual flu season. Influenza B circulating early this year. That strain particularly severe in kids. We have surely seen it take a toll on them like we've seen in very few other 
uh, flu seasons. The CDC reporting today 29 million cases of flu so far this season. An estimated 280,000 people hospitalized. One hospital in St. Louis seeing more than 200 cases just last week. 10 to 15 percent of those cases end up in the ICUs. Health officials seem to think it is only a matter of time until the coronavirus starts to spread through communities here in the United States. The Centers for Disease Control says it is preparing medical personnel on how to contain the spread of its flu-like illness. So far, 34 coronavirus cases have been confirmed in the U.S., but there have been more than 76,000 worldwide, the vast majority in China. And overnight, there was a huge surge of cases in South Korea. More than 2,200 people around the world have died. We're not seeing community spread here in the United States yet, but it's very possible even likely that it may eventually happen. This new virus represents a tremendous public health threat. We don't yet have a vaccine, nor do we have a medicine to treat it specifically. Well, despite warnings like the one you just heard, a plane full of coronavirus infected people was reportedly still allowed to fly back into the United States against the wishes of the Centers for Disease Control. Now, as all of this unfolds, we're learning of the disturbing new coronavirus outbreak in Iran, which apparently has no links to China. The disease has now taken 2,200 lives worldwide, if you can believe those figures. And we still don't have all that much confidence that China is being truthful about the origins of the coronavirus, and for good reason. Joining me now, Senator Tom Cotton, someone who has rightfully viewed China with an extremely skeptical and critical eye but long before this ever uh, happened, and he's gotten a lot of grief for it. Senator, how do we protect against a disease coming into the United States? It's already killed a lot of people that originated in a country we can't trust with just primary, rudimentary information about medical or other issues. Laura, thanks for having me on to discuss this important matter. So the president made the very decisive step about three weeks ago to stop all air travel from China into the United States. That was an important step. Now, we have to realize, though, that more than a million and a half people came from mainland China starting in mid-November until late January, whenever the president instituted that travel ban. So it's very important that our public health officials know if anyone got any kind of viral pneumonia, especially if they were in China or in contact with someone who was in China. It's also critical that we have a surge of resources into our pharmaceutical and our biotechnology industries supported by our national institutes of health and other national laboratories to try to identify effective, competent diagnostic testing and a vaccine as quickly as possible. I have high confidence in the state of American ingenuity in medicine and science. I have very low confidence in the state of Chinese politics because their government is still lying to the world about this deadly serious matter. Now, this plane that carried all these uh, individuals back into the United States, there's a long piece in the Washington Post about how there was a raging debate, uh, including the Centers for Disease Control and other administration officials, about whether to allow these individuals back in, given how little information we really know about real incubation periods, real ability to test, et cetera. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control said, I guess you guys can do what you want, but we're not putting our names on this press release you're putting out. Now, that concerns me a lot, that there, there seems to be a, a, a stark disagreement within our government about how to handle infected patients. So, Laura, I think it was a, a very uh, last-minute decision, given the facts on the ground. These Americans were on the Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan. It seems now a very unwise decision of the Japanese government to have kept all those passengers on the cruise ship, given the way it has spread across the cruise ship. Americans who were known to have the coronavirus were taken to Japanese hospitals, but we had about 350 Americans who were going to board planes to come back to American military bases while they'll be quarantined here. At the last minute, apparently, about a dozen of them tested positive. Fortunately, the planes already had segregated areas for people who appeared symptomatic in flight. I understand it was a tough call at the last minute, and there were not surprisingly disagreements. I think uh, Donald Trump's democratically accountable officials made the decision, though, that they wanted to err on the side of bringing Americans back to the United States, and I'm sympathetic to that decision. All of those people, whether they were symptomatic or not, are now under quarantine on military basis. 
All right, Senator, the other night I pressed the head of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, about China's trustworthiness, and here's what he said. The WHO has finally gotten a team of people, an international group, to go over there. Right now, at this point in time, I, I believe those numbers. I'm surprised that you would say that, given what we know well, about yeah, China's well, pattern of lying. In my direct interaction with Chinese scientists and Chinese health officials, not party politics people, but medical people and scientists, that I can believe what they're telling me. Senator, uh, do you have the same view of Chinese scientists and there's like a line between the scientists and the CCP, the Communist Party of China? Well, well first, Laura, I want to say that I have the highest respect for doc Dr. Fauci. So do I. But That's I do have I a different perspective here. Yeah. So I, I don't disagree that China's scientists and doctors can in some cases be world class and they can be professional. However, they have sitting next to them at every level of government a minder from the Chinese Communist Party. And I do not have any confidence in those party apparatchiks allowing China scientists or their doctors to speak freely to anyone outside of China, especially officials in the United States government. That's why we've seen the numbers of this coronavirus continue to spike in kind of strange, unpredictable patterns. Those aren't newly discovered cases. Those are newly disclosed cases because China is carefully managing the flow of information about this virus. Yeah, and you've been called uh, someone who floats conspiracy theories because you questioned the comments, uh, or the justification they gave about how this all started. And you, met, you mentioned the fact that there's a level four lab in the Wuhan province uh, where uh, sought to have biological weapons, capability of production. Uh, any new thoughts on that? Well, um, Laura, we know that it didn't start in the Wuhan food market. That was the original story of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's only responsible to ask where it did start. I still think the most likely hypothesis is it was naturally occurring. But given the proximity of that laboratory to the food market, it is only reasonable that we ask the Chinese Communist Party to be open and transparent about the kind of research they were conducting there and the safety protocols and practices they had in place. Until China provides the evidence we cannot know for sure where this virus originated. Senator, thank you for raising these questions. Few are doing so, and we really appreciate your leadership in general uh, on the China question. So thank you so much for being with us tonight. Psalm 18.7, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. Now, within the last hour or so, we've been learning of there having been an earthquake in the far eastern province of Turkey, Van, uh, right on the border with Iran. The epicentre, though, of this uh, earthquake apparently is on the other side of the border in Iran, in a small village a few kilometres away from the Turkish border. But Hashem Ahubara is our correspondent. He's in Hatay province in southern Turkey. What more can you tell us then about this earthquake that is affecting uh, eastern Turkey as well as western Iran? Well, the authorities here are saying that eight people were killed and 21 injured in the 5.7 magnitude earthquake that hit the areas on the border with Iran, particularly in the province of uh, Van. And the areas particularly affected are uh, Guvelik and uh, Ospina. Now, the, they also say that they are concerned many people are still trapped under the rubble and the uh, uh, rescue operation uh, is underway. We're talking about an area that's on the border and the authorities and the rescuers have really to go through all those villages in the mountainous areas for them to be able to establish and gauge the scope and the magnitude of uh, the, the damage. And those areas are on the border with Iran. And this explains why they are some of the most uh, seismically active uh, in the world. In last month, for example, uh, 41 people were killed in an earthquake that hit two provinces in, uh, in, uh, in, in the eastern part of Turkey, Elaza and Malatya, and more than 1,500 people uh, were injured in that uh, earthquake. The authorities are saying they are uh, doing their best to try to get closer to the, all the areas that are affected and to ensure that also they retrieve all those who are still now uh, uh, buried under the rubble.
Some are calling it the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today. Nearly a million civilians are fleeing the fighting between Syrian forces of Bashar Assad, backed by Russia, and rebel Islamist groups backed by Turkish President Erdogan in the northeastern Syrian province of Idlib. The UN is sounding the alarm. We remain very alarmed about the safety and protection of over 3 million civilians in Idlib and its surrounding areas in the northwestern part of Syria, as reports of airstrikes and shelling continue to take a heavy toll on the civilian population. Various sources report Turkey has supplied some of these al-Qaeda groups with U.S.-supplied weapons. And our Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now with more. Chris, elaborate on that. U.S. weapons in the hands of terrorists? What's going on? Well, Mark, that's a concern of many over here. The idea is that uh, Erdogan is backing many of these Islamic groups that have sought refuge in Idlib. That's probably the last place where these rebel groups that are Islamist groups tried to overthrow the uh, Assad uh, regime backed by Russia. So what uh, Turkey is doing, what Erdogan is doing, is actually giving some of these, uh, these groups U.S. supplied weapons. And that's uh, really a danger uh, for a lot of people. He's also asking the United States to provide Patriot uh, anti-missile batteries uh, to protect the groups as they're coming out. Uh, we know that last year he, uh, he worked with the Free Syrian Army, that is Erdogan, that was an Islamist group that he used to invade parts of uh, uh, northeast uh, Syria. So there's a concern of many. There's actually a solution proposed for this whole crisis, uh, Mark, by Walid Ferez. He wants the UN to really take over Idlib and the neighboring uh, province of Afrin, uh, a situation he believes would be much better for the people of Idlib and that part of Syria. Chris, what is the human cost of this crisis in Syria? Well, Mark, it's hard to overestimate the, uh, uh, the human cost over there. Uh, talking about nearly a million people that are trying to flee, another two or three million that are displaced uh, within that region. It's winter right now uh, in Syria. Some people are having to make the decision whether or not to burn the clothes of their children, if you can consider it's getting that desperate uh, for some people. Also, food is scarce and uh, housing is scarce. And many of these people have been moving from place to place uh, during the uh, during this whole Syrian civil war. They're in the middle of a war zone and, and really one thing that's really telling Mark has been a video that's gone viral and it's a father playing with his daughter playing a game so every time there's an airstrike an explosion he says well isn't that uh, something we should laugh about so they're laughing about an airstrike and really poignant uh, observation he made he says well even if we die we'll die laughing so that just gives you an idea of the human cost of nearly a million people or more not too far away from here in Israel inside uh, northeast Syria. Heartbreaking to hear. What about the Christians who are still there? Well, many of the Christians have already fled, but some of their homes, in fact, uh, one report says that more than 500 homes uh, that have and businesses that have been owned by Christians have been uh, confiscated by some of these Islamic terrorist groups. They're using those homes as some of their bases. Uh, but many, as I said, people have fled, and, uh, and, and really this has been repeated over and over in the last several years throughout the uh, Middle East, whether it's in Syria or northern Iraq. So many of these Christians have fled, and those that have remained, many have had their homes and businesses uh, confiscated. Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Are you discerning the times? One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!
The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.